Jimbo said yesterday that um, at some point while you're in the hospital, it's like he was going to beat your butt. That wasn't the word that he used, but did you have any response for that? In golf? <laughs> <laughs> I think you I think he meant on the football field. <laughs> well, I'm sure there will come a day, you know. Let's go right here in the middle of the damn field. Let's bring it down, take it on three. Hell yeah! Because this is our house from now on. Yes, sir. Take it on three. One, two, three. Hey. Hey. But I'm going to tell you this. We ain't done yet. I've got to ask you about the message on your shirt. Uh, my favorite holiday of the year, I guess. And, you know, so just um, someone gave me a shirt and Merry Christmas. They spelled it wrong. So, you know, it was free. Coach, it's a great day for you, huh? That's a, yeah, it's better than average, I'll tell you that. <laughs> that, that <laughs> we played LSU because, you know, New England, Green Bay, and the Chiefs. Uh, <laughs> Had somebody scheduled. You know what we're gonna do though? We gotta quickly call the hogs for the race back. Yep. Yeah. 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 The fact you're dressed as Darth Vader, do you feel like you were somewhat of a villain in this fight? I mean, you charged out on the field pretty hard. I was trying though. to get our players off the field, you know, because I know we have a big game next week. All I want to do is fucking eat. I want you to eat. I want you to eat. I want you to want this shit. Do you want it? Do you want it? Show me. Oh, welcome in to the latest episode of that SEC podcast. I'm your host, Michael Bratton. I go by SEC Mike on Twitter. And I'm flying solo for this episode, but don't worry. Got a terrific guest lined up. We got Keith Alsop of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. Going to hop on the line here, take a deep dive on them South Carolina Gamecocks. There's been so much news here the last uh, week or two here with the Gamecocks. So had to reach out to uh, South Carolina Insider here to give us the lowdown on what's going on down there in Columbia. But uh, before we get to that, of course, we've got to mention the sponsors, HelloFresh. If you haven't checked it out already, I know Shane, he's probably stuffing his face right now with one of those delicious dinners from HelloFresh. Head on over to HelloFresh.com slash SECMike14 to get up to 14 free meals, courtesy of that SEC podcast. And of course, we also sponsored by FanDuel. Head on over to FanDuel.com slash SECMike14 for a 20% deposit bonus up to $500. And the reason why that's so perfect is uh, we got to start with uh, some week one lines here in the SEC. Ooh, it feels like football. Just did a radio show out there in uh, Mississippi. Jake Wimberly, friend of the show, was just on his program. But we were talking about uh, opening weekend of the college football season. And I know technically it's this week with week zero, whatever they want to call it. But it really starts in a little over a week when the SEC hits the field. So, of course, that's all we're going to talk about here. We got some week one lines and a couple, uh, a couple of these I like. A lot of them, a lot of them, truth be told, are stay away from me. I, I tend to stay away from the higher point spreads. So let's take a look at some of these spreads here. Bowling Green at Tennessee, of course, the SEC opener, and Tennessee favored by 34 points. That's a lot of points. For an opener, a lot of points for them balls, given the offense we've seen in recent seasons. But, of course, this ain't Jeremy Pruitt's balls. This is Josh Heupel's Tennessee program. So 34 still, a lot of points there. But I I would lean towards Tennessee on that one. Then we get into Saturday's action. ULM at Kentucky, minus 29 in favor of the Wildcats. That's a huge line. Again, I tend to stay away from these higher lines, but I probably lean towards Kentucky at this moment. Now, here's one I do like. Rice at Arkansas. Arkansas favored by 18 and a half. The Owls coming into town. You know they're going to get smoked by 20 or more points. Now, here's one I really love. Alabama minus 19 and a half against Miami. And, of course, this game is in Atlanta. But it just seems like the Crimson Tide always smoke people out right out the gate. Miami's quarterback, King, still limping into this one. They say he's going to be good to go, but, uh, you know, that remains to be seen. So I would favor Alabama heavily. you got to think they're going to win by more than 20 points. And here's the, the head scratchers. Again, this is a stay away. I know this is a smaller line here, but Central Michigan at Missouri. 
This thing debuted at like 11. It's up to 13 and a half in favor of the Missouri Tigers. We know Missouri's going to win, but uh, this tells me the, the odds makers know something that we don't. So I don't know. If you're a diehard Missouri fan, definitely bet that up. I could wouldn't blame you at all because you got to feel like Missouri's a hell of a lot better program than old Jim McElwain CMU, but something's off with that line. That's a stay away. Louisiana Tech at Mississippi State, minus 23 and a half. That's probably a stay away for me, too. Uh, it's not that I don't think Mississippi State's going to win that game. We know they will, but that's a lot of points. And the the offense was so inconsistent. Got to see it there for Mississippi State before I'm leaning, giving them that many points. Akron at Auburn, minus 35. Again, <laughs> I know Akron's probably garbage, but I, that's a stay away. Too many points there. FAU at Florida, minus 24 and a half. Tend to like the Gators there. We're going to talk some uh, Florida Gators football here in just a second. Georgia Clemson. Now, this is probably my favorite bet. You know, all these uh, guys out for, for Georgia. So everybody's back on the Clemson bandwagon. Get the hell out of here. Georgia, you're going to give me points. This is probably the only time this season Georgia's going to be getting points. So it may only be three, but I'd take those three in a heartbeat with that game in Charlotte. Kent State at Texas A&M, minus 29. Again, probably too many points here because we know the Aggies are going to smoke Kent State, but how soon do we pull these starters? You know what I mean? So uh, I could certainly see Kent State maybe getting a late touchdown or two once A&M's on their third string. Uh, so 29, that's a stay away from me. Ole Miss versus Louisville. Got to favor the Rebels there, minus eight with Matt Corral and company, and we know how bad Louisville's been in recent seasons. Just some lines to consider here as we <laughs> eagerly await the start of the SEC season. So head on over to FanDuel.com slash SEC Mike for a 20% bonus on your first deposit with FanDuel. But uh, that's enough about me spieling about these sponsors. Let's kick it around the league. Now let's go now around the league. Um... What, what what is twelve personnel? You know, I I, I got to get up two tight ends and two wide receivers or one. I, I'm just kidding. I don't know what twelve personnel is. So I worry about playing Alabama. I can't figure out whether or not the Big Ten and Back Twelve are gonna yo-yo around and play football with us or not. I mean, they're playing great. Love it. Love the game. Awesome game. It's unbelievable for our country. Uh, it's it's great for our universities. It's great for our towns when we play. It's great for our young men. Uh, you know, it, I think it's personally think it's the greatest game in the world. So if they elect to play, great. If they don't, uh, yeah, you know, that's 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 on them. I, I got enough crap to worry about with preparing for Alabama and figuring stuff out at Mizzou. So the team is in great spirits. I know there was a lot of doom and gloom. I saw and heard a lot about how uh, the, the hopes of our season hinged on the results of an MRI. And frankly, or frankly, that's bull crap. Uh, we've got a hell of a football team. And whether one guy's in or out, we got 117 other guys that are ready to step up no matter who's out. We got Kevin. All right, I'm not a big opening statement guy, and plus you guys are going to ask whatever you want to know anyway. So let's just go ahead and get started. Is there any questions? Young man from Nestor Hand, Louisiana. Hold on a second. Hey, guys. Hey, I'm having a press conference, okay? Thank you. Uh, great young man. All right, we haven't talked to Florida Gators football in a while, and uh, maybe in part that has to do with the fact that, uh, you know, they've completely closed off access to the team. There's been no media view viewing whatsoever, so we're kind of all in the dark here on what's going on in Gainesville, but they just held their latest scrimmage, and all indication out of Gainesville is the guy perceived to be the backup quarterback, Anthony Richardson, once again can. Uh, continues to stand out, had a very strong scrimmage while Emory Jones struggling, and that's been a consistent theme. Uh, and, you know, Dan Mullen's been very eager to hype up Emory Jones. He's been very eager to hype up Anthony Richardson too. So uh, the way he trains those quarterbacks down there, he gets multiple quarterbacks ready to be starters. That's the way he puts it. So very interesting 
I'm not saying that uh, Anthony Richardson is going to be your week one starter, but if Emory Jones can't handle being the full-time Florida Gators starting quarterback, would not be surprised at all at this point to see Richardson overtake him. And we got to keep in mind, I mean, Emory Jones came with so much hype. He was the guy that was supposed to replace Felipe Franks, and that didn't happen. Uh, So, I don't know, it could be a situation here where Maybe he's just not always cracked up to be. and Or maybe maybe he is, and maybe Anthony Richards is just that much better uh, because he's a touted guy too. I believe he was a, he was a high school All-American. So uh, he could be the next great Dan Mullen quarterback. Uh, so let's not discredit Richardson and his talent, but if he's you know the one standing out there in camp, it's going to be very interesting to see uh, how this – what I didn't realize would be such a competition and may be here. Now, Emory Jones may have a full grasp, kind of goes back to what I said. Everybody's kind of in the dark down there in Gainesville. So maybe this is a smokescreen. Maybe Emory Jones is about to win the Heisman Trophy. <laughs> I mean, given the fact that uh, the last couple of Dan Mullen quarterbacks have either contended for that or been all-conference selections, it wouldn't stun me either. So, uh, you know, this is going to be an interesting one to, to play out here. And uh, I cannot wait to see what uh, Dan Mullins got cooked up down there in Gainesville. I believe they'd probably be playing both quarterbacks. Kind of like, you know, Emory Jones, he's he's never really started for the Gators, but he's played significantly. It's not like he's totally inexperienced. He's played in some big-time games, uh, like Dan Mullins about to talk about, the SEC Championship. He's played against Georgia. Uh, They get him on the field early and often. So I think, if nothing else, let's say Emory Jones – is the starting quarterback and performs well. We're still going to see Anthony Richardson quite a bit uh, because, you know, we saw that paid off when Felipe Franks went down and Kyle Trask was ready to roll. Uh, There was no – they basically uh, put that game in his hands there on the road against Kentucky, and he delivered. So uh, look for that to just continue to be the theme here in Gainesville. But this is suddenly a little bit more of a quarterback controversy than uh, I think many people realized it would be going into training camp. So let's kick it over to Dan Mullen, who uh, met with the media here on Monday and talked uh, quite a bit. And you could tell, based on the, some of these questions from the media members, they're trying to gauge, you know, how accurate these were, what they're hearing. I, I what they're hearing about Anthony Richardson. He, you know, could did he play better in the scrimmage? Uh, what's what's the role for him going to be? It's it's very interesting. These questions posed to Dan Mullen. Hey, curiously, uh, do you have a do you have a, do you envision what Anthony Richardson's role is going to be? And can you just take us through how he looked in the uh, second scrimmage? Yeah, I think he looked great. Uh, you know, I think he's prepared himself to be the starter, and which is what you want. You know, so uh, you know he's going to be ready to get on the field and. Uh, you know, uh, in just about any situation that it is. Now, it's our job to kind of put him in the different situations, um, you know, so that he has that experience in every different possible scenario for when he is on the field. Um, I want to take you back to to Emory's freshman season. You played him uh, in the Georgia game. Mm -hmm. Maybe not necessarily a lot of people expecting that. What do you remember about that experience that he had, his first real significant piece of action? Uh, well, I think you know. I think if you go back to that, there is a there is a plan. I think he played in the against Georgia. He played against Michigan in the the uh, in the Peach Bowl, and he uh, played two other games. But I think he played a little more significant in that. And a lot of that is designed around getting him into different situations. I think he played two games that we won big, so he got a bunch of reps in those games. And then he played in two big games, so he had big game experience. And so that as you continue to grow throughout your career, part of that is just checking the box. If I put him in all the situations I need to put him in to be successful, so he's prepared to handle it all. And so that was kind of the strategy. There's always a strategy behind why you do it. It is, uh, I, I, again, I'm not trying to ask you to tip your hand here, but is that a similar strategy with Anthony this year? or just A little bit. We did it last year, too. You know, I mean, you go back and look at the, look at where he played in last year and the games he played in last year, you know, between him and, and Emery of the different times and games and situations he played in last year. I think, I mean, trying to think of all of them, you know, I know like, I mean, Emery, for example, played the second series of the SEC championship game. So, I mean, he's been on the field at, right in the beginning in the first quarter of an SEC championship game, make a play. So, 
Um, you know, Anthony, I know I'm pretty sure we put him in some other situations to go do things on the field the same way. Um, a lot of that's just about their development and making sure we're continuing that they grow throughout their, their, their time here and they're continuing to grow and get better and they're ready for whatever scenario they, that comes their way. All right, so there you have it from Dan Mullen. But, you know, as you can tell, he's playing at Coy down there. He's not going to give away anything. But just based on everything he said, I mean, hell, Anthony Richardson prepared to be the starting quarterback, prepared himself to be a starter is more accurately what he said. But I wouldn't read too much into that. It's kind of like I said down there in, in his program, in Dan Mullen's program there, that's how they like to train these quarterbacks, to get everybody ready for the season like they're a starter got to have multiple starters because you're only one play away but aside from the quarterbacks you know one of the biggest uh, topics there in Gainesville is the secondary given last season's mass miscommunications led to so many big plays and now that Jaden Hill is done for the season with an ACL tear uh, who's going to step up opposite Kyle Elam How's Elam doing? Just named a preseason All-American. So Dan Mullen talks about his secondary, which is uh, under a new position coach as well this season in Gainesville. Yeah, Dan, um, Kyler Elam just named preseason All-American on second team. We haven't talked a ton about him. I guess we just kind of assume he'll be what he has been. But how important is he? I guess how much will this secondary sort of go as he goes? Well, I, you know, I don't know. He's the, the one thing I think that he's grown into is more of a leadership role back there. You know, I think he's a guy that's very conscientious, does things the right way, uh, you know, takes care of his business. Obviously, a playmaker on the field, uh, uh, does uh, a, a fabulous student as well in the classroom and, and, you know, really lives up to what the Gator standard is all about. Uh, but also, you know, I think now he has the opportunity realizing, hey, I'm the veteran older guy, even though, you know, it doesn't seem like he's been here forever, um, that I'm one of the, I'm the older veteran guy and I got to be a leader and, and he's bought into that role as well. Hey, Dan, um, I want to ask you who's starting at the cornerback position opposite Kyrie, but who is getting the reps over there and how's that position looking? Yeah, there, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, let's see. You got Avery Helm, Jason Marshall, uh, Elijah Blades, Jadarius Perkins, uh, Pat Moore, Ethan Pouncey are the ones getting the reps for the most part. Um, I might have missed somebody in there uh, that are getting that reps. Um, so they're doing pretty good. So, you know, they're, they're getting all their reps and getting that, that opportunity to show what they can go do. All right, so based on what uh, Dan Mullen had to say right there, I mean, it, he seems like he's pretty satisfied with uh, the depth they've got there after uh, Jadon Hill went down for the season-ending injury. And it all starts with Kyrie Elam, who, uh, you know, he's one of the best players, not only as a defensive back, but just overall in the entire SEC. So uh, that's a hell of a piece to start with there. Uh, now the biggest question is going to be who's going to step up uh, opposite him because you got to imagine defenses are going to stay completely away from Elam all, off, all season because they know what he's got. So uh, whoever that is on the opposite side, is it going to be the freshman Marshall? Will it be Elijah Blades, who recently transferred in from Texas A&M? Will it be Perkins, the uh, standout junior college player that they that signed with Missouri and then transferred to Florida? So they've got them some options down there in Gainesville, but uh, all those guys have got to be ready to play because I would imagine – Opposing offenses are just going to completely stay away from Elam as much as, as humanly possible. Uh, so that means those other guys are going to be seeing tons and tons of passes thrown their way. All right, the only other team to hit on here, let's kick it all down to Rocky Top. So while everybody and their mother is saying Joe Bilton's going to be the starting quarterback, the guy that won't say it is the most important one, Josh Heupel. Uh, that was a question posed to Coach Heupel time and time again here on Monday. And for whatever reason, <laughs> he does not want to tip his hand going into a contest against Bowling Green, one of the worst teams in college football. Let's kick it over to Josh Heupel, who maybe he's just not uh, made his decision. I don't know. But uh, uh, apparently from what I'm hearing, all the reps are first team reps are going to Joe Milton. So uh, here's what Josh Heupel said. Uh, about the quarterbacks, he was asked many different ways about the quarterback uh, competition. Coach, just the obligatory quarterback question: Have you established a, a, a court? A, you wanted to be the first one to go. 
Yeah, yeah, let's get it out. Let's get it out of the way. All right, I like it. Yeah, uh, no decisions uh, have been made. Uh, those guys have been great. Continue to compete. Um, we'll see where we're at here at uh, at the end of this week. Uh, Josh, how have, you, how have you guys splitting up reps at quarterback right now, and, and how has Joe handled not having a spring? Well, him not having spring is just what it is. Um, you know, so for him, yeah, he's got less time on task in, in what we're doing offensively. Uh, he spent a ton of time in, in May uh, learning what we were doing before everybody was back in, in June. The, the, the quarterback group as a collective group has spent a ton of time and energy, you know, really becoming refined in what we're doing. I thought, you know, where the guys that were here in spring ball, how they showed up in training camp, fundamentally technique, completely different. Joe's really progressed, you know, during the course of, of our training camp. Um, you know, you look at the first half and then the second half, um, much more comfortable in what we're asking him to do and uh, has great ownership. Fox News, an another follow-up on quarterbacks. You said no decisions have been made. Do the players know who the starter is and how is uh, – it, is there a value to them – knowing at a certain date and their teammates knowing so many days out? I said in the beginning, uh, once we've had a guy that has earned it and uh, proven it in some, some respects, not just to, uh, to the staff but to the teammates, um, then you're able to, to announce the guy. And, and uh, I think our, our football team has great trust in, in all three of those guys, the way they've competed and continued to grow and gotten, gotten better. And, and uh, um, when we're ready to name a guy, we will. All right. Hey, so <laughs> we got to credit that. Uh, I wish I knew his name, but the uh, UCF reporter that uh, I believe is a Tennessee grad, he called this one out, man. He said, uh, you know, just look at his track record down here at UCF. He, Josh Heupel will not name a starting quarterback. He'll probably name it uh, leading up to kickoff. And, and I think he meant like the day of the game. So uh, it may be a little while here before we get a starting quarterback named for Tennessee. Uh, but uh it, by all indications, unless there's some huge, massive development there, it's going to be Joe Milton against Bowling Green here just a little over a week from now. So uh, it's it's real. I mean, they've got to be getting close to who to know who their starting quarterback is. With uh, we're about nine days out from that opener, so that's something to keep your eye on. But uh, I think more importantly than just who's going to start for quarter start for the Vols at the quarterback position is uh, the offense just the entire offense installation how how is that going and everybody's got questions about this defense and Josh Heupel notes the flexibility will be key and uh, I'll hit on that on the other side when you when you look at how you guys are trying to install the offense in the spring and then you get here to fall camp how do you think your players have adapted playbook wise but also you know maybe formations that you're running out there in practice them getting that down, do you think that they've been able to grasp what you've been putting out? Over yeah, the last offensively, four, our, our kids do grasp what we're doing. I think during training camp, because you're constantly installing, uh, you get to game week, you know, a week from now, and, and you put in your package. In some ways, it becomes easier for, for them, right? Um, and uh, um, I think they have a good understanding of what we're doing. Uh, they've gotten on the same page with the quarterbacks. Uh, they're handling the tempo portion of it extremely well, uh, handling you know the whistle to the next snap uh, in a much better way. Um, you know, I, I think you know th that's a position that we got to continue to develop guys at though as well as we go through the season. Um, you know, Javante, you know, like um, uh, Milton, we were talking about earlier. It's a guy that's only got you know 14, 15 practices in what we're doing. So. He's a guy that's really come on here the last you know, four or five practices as far as comfort and understanding uh, how we want to play and then being able to play the play. Hey, Coach, Tim Banks has said in an ideal defense there's flexibility at every position, especially in the secondary. That's a unit that <coughs> just had five interceptions last season. How would you assess where they are right now 10 days out from game day? And secondly, what were your conversations like with Brian Maurer that maybe led to him transferring? The, uh, the defensive backfield, uh, I think there is flexibility there. You have guys that have played multiple positions. Uh, we've stressed that since we got here. Uh, as you go back and look at spring ball, the summer, and this fall training camp, guys have been put, put in multiple positions. As somebody gets nicked up or matchups, uh, or, or maybe you want to change up the matchups uh, during the course of, of a game week, the flexibility of those guys to play multiple positions. At the end of the day, the more you know, the more comfort you have, the more ownership you have. Um, and creates flexibility during the course of the season too. Uh, I like that group in this that I think they have a clear understanding of what we're doing. 
and are able to play once the ball is snapped as fast as they are. Just one of the things that when I first got here and having conversations with our players, um, you know, that was something that, that they struggled with. And, and uh, I think they like what we're doing on the defensive side of the ball, being multiple, but being able to line up and play football. So I love the fact they're talking flexibility because when we talk Tennessee, that's something that I say time and time again. You know, they are not going to have the depth that many other SEC teams, and that's obviously a function of so many guys transferring out. So, uh, you know, once an injury or two occurs, things could get dicey all across the board, but you help that with the flexibility, like he, like Josh Heupel's mentioning here, because, and, and what does you mean by that is just, you know, you get guys reps all across the defensive formation, whether it's a safety corner, nickel, uh, getting linebackers, maybe even, uh, in the nickel position, getting defense alignment to play linebacker and vice versa. So all across the board, you got to have pieces that can mix and match. And uh, like he said, it really depends on who you're facing that week and what they like to do and the personnel packages that they have. So uh, flexibility will certainly be key for the Tennessee Vols this season, given their uh, issues across the board at depth. And, you know, that's one thing. They say about training camp, no news is good news. And for the most part, I'm not trying to jinx anything here. I feel like I'm jinxing it, just saying it. But uh, Tennessee has avoided significant injuries for the most part in this training camp. So it's a great start to the upcoming season. Tennessee, unlike some of these other teams, uh, cannot afford to, to have massive injuries across the board here because they just don't have the numbers. So things are starting out right here on Rocky Top. And, you know, it's almost game week here for Tennessee. And, and I just can't wait for it. I'm, I'm sitting here just daydreaming about uh, that first SEC game, SEC network game against Bowling Green with the new lights. They're installing LED lights and all that. So it's going to be one hell of a night uh, there on Rocky Top. But all right, n- enough of me spieling about here. Let's kick it into our interview with Keith Alsap of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. Well, we're pleased to uh, once again be joined by Keith Alsap. Of course, he's the host of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. You can follow Keith at K Alsap, and of course, his podcast is at Gamecock Pod. Keith, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. Michael, it's always a pleasure to uh, speak to the dean of <laughs> podcasting. Oh, I don't know about that, but I do, I do appreciate the kind words, my friend. So, uh, you know, I got to ask you. Big question there for the Gamecocks. Who's going to be the starting quarterback week one? Any idea? Well, it's uh, nothing that has officially been announced, but uh, there's a lot of momentum for former Iowa State turned North Dakota State turned graduate assistant, now turned back to <laughs> quarterback Zeb Noland. Uh, he performed very well coming out of the scrimmage. Uh, I would not rule out uh, Jason Brown, who's a transfer uh, from a D3 program as well. He's been in the program since March, but he really didn't get much time in the spring due to COVID. Uh, he lost 20, almost 20 pounds this summer, really reshaped his body, really worked hard, but Here's the thing with Zeb Nolan that they like is it's probably only going to be one or two games and then Luke Doty will, you know, take back over as QB one at South Carolina. Mm -hmm. You open up with Eastern Illinois and then you travel to East Carolina. Those are two games that are critical. I mean, absolutely critical. Uh, for Shane Beamer in year one, if he wants to try to get to six wins and get a bowl bid. And the last thing you need is either a true freshman or someone that's not familiar with that offense, uh, because that could lead to pick sixes or fumbles or throwing an interception in the end zone or in the red zone to really help keep an undermanned opponent in a game. Zeb Noland has more experience than the rest of the quarterback room combined and he helped write this playbook and has been working on it since he arrived this summer 
And he just played like seven or eight games at North Dakota State in the spring. So I think there's a lot of momentum right now for Zeb Nolan to be the starting quarterback in game one and then to be determined once Luke Doty gets back from that uh, injury. So, you know, based on what you just said there, uh, you know, things can can change. I'm not going to hold you to this, but based on what you're hearing, is it uh, do you fully expect Luke Doty's not going to be able to play in the opener? I would really be shocked, Michael, at this point if uh, he's able to go. I mean, he got his foot stepped on by, you know, rather large individual, and just <laughs> a freak accident. And, uh, you know, fortunately, it was not as bad as they initially feared because there were some fears inside the program. Be a Liz Frank injury, similar to what Jake Bentley suffered against North Carolina in 2019 on the final play of the game, or uh, potentially kicking the locker in disgust based off who you listen to on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess so there's two sides of that coin. Uh, but fortunately, it was uh, labeled a sprain, uh, not uh, a fracture or a break. And so, you know, I, I think it would be a, a minor miracle for him to be ready to go. Now, I'm not going to say he's not going to have practice, but, you know, when you have a boot on and you can't, and it's your plant foot, that's just going to take more time. And so mm -hmm. I think they'll be very cautious with him because, He's only started a couple of games, and you really, when he comes back, you want to put him in situations where he can be successful, not having to depend on playing on one leg, particularly for a guy that's a true 4-5 or five guy in the 40 like Luke Doty is. And what does it say about Shane Beamer in your mind that, uh, you know, like you said, I mean, we were all counting on Luke Doty to roll out there week one, but... Now your alternatives, potentially a true freshman or an FCS quarterback that, uh, you know, of course, they didn't get to play football because of COVID last year. So he's really rusty. Uh, so it kind of seems like, you know, it's hard to say if Shane Beamer had this in the back of his mind. You know, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But, uh, you know, credit to him where I, I think once again, he's just working his coaching connections to get uh, – you know, people in the building that uh, in case of an emergency like this, he can go to a Zeb Nolan. So I think if you're a Gamecock fan, it gives you a little added confidence that this guy is not in over his head by any means. Because like you said, we're all penciling in those first two games as, a, as wins. It should be easy wins. I mean, this is the SEC we're talking about here. But you drop one of those games and all of a sudden the fans are out on you. You know what I mean? So uh, I don't know. Is that kind of how you read the situation there with Shane Beamer? Well, Michael, I just think it's all hands on deck. This was something that internally was being talked about in the summer that they might do to go ahead and start fall practice. And then, you know, Luke Doty, I think in his second practice in full pads in a red zone drill, gets his foot stepped on. I mean, look, I'm not assigning blame because freak accidents happen all the time, but I doubt there's any other quarterback that didn't at least make it to the first scrimmage without an injury, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that just puts you behind the eight ball, and then you have to look at the next best option and what's best for your football team. And Marcus Satterfield spoke to the media last week, and he said, look, hey, we're not asking whoever starts game one to go out and win the Heisman Trophy. We want somebody that can manage the game, that can manage the offense, get our offense into the right plays, out of the bad plays, and manage the game. And Zeb Noland may be the best guy to do that because he's got the most experience. And like you said, Jason Brown, he hasn't played since 2019. And Zeb Noland just played in April. Mm-hmm. Now, let me ask you about uh, Kevin Harris. I mean, potentially the best running back in the entire SEC uh, by all accounts. You know, they expect him to be back in the lineup, but uh, how realistic is that? Uh, I, I don't know what surgery he had. They 
you know, all accounts, it's a minor issue, but running back, getting a back surgery doesn't sound like, uh, you know, something you'd want to happen leading up to a season. Well, Michael, I mean, there's no such thing as a minor back surgery, not for a football player anyway, because football is a collision sport. It's not a contact sport. Basketball is a contact sport. Football is a collision sport. Anytime you're dealing with the spinal cord, the disc, the vertebrae, the nerves, um, you have to be extra careful and it just takes time uh, for the muscles around that once you make an incision. Uh, I had two lower back surgeries as a young, younger man, but that was still 30 years ago. And so I don't know. I mean, I know this. He is a, a quick healer. He's doing everything outside of contact. I would not expect him to be a go for the first game, possibly the first two games, simply because, one, South Carolina is not short on talent in the running back room. Last year, leading up to the season, Kevin Harris was not going to be the starter. Marshawn Lloyd was going to be the starter. He suffered an early non-contact ACL tear when his, you know, he just planted his foot and his knee buckled a little bit, and that was it. Um, so you've got him. You've got Zaquandre White, who was a junior college All-American, a guy that was a national top 150 prospect out of Fort Myers, Florida. Uh, went to junior college after... Uh, I don't even want to talk about the guy that was at Florida State after Jimbo. Probably Florida State fans don't want to either. Uh, but, you know, he was moved to defense. He left and went to JUCO. He was a JUCO All-American, came in last year, got some chances early. Ball security was an issue. So he was primarily a special teams player. And the way Harris had it going, uh, he played a little bit of defense as well. He had a great spring. He's had a great fall camp. And so you got Marshawn Lloyd, you got Zaquandre White, you got Rashad Amos, who's 6'2, 225 pounds, and a legit 4'5 guy in the 40 that played some, broke off a 34 yard run against Georgia last year. And you have, uh, I'm calling him Mighty Mouse because he's probably only about 5'7, 165 pounds. McDowell from Lee County, Georgia, he's turned a lot of heads. I think he'll probably be an all-purpose type guy, but South Carolina feels very good about the talent and the running back room, and so I think they want to save Kevin Harris for towards the end of September when you start getting into games that really matter. And I'm not saying that Georgia game doesn't matter, but South Carolina doesn't have to beat Georgia to go to a bowl. When you get into games like Kentucky, Tennessee, Vanderbilt, uh, Missouri, Auburn. Those are the swing games that are going to determine, along with the non-conference games, uh, that will determine South Carolina's fate. And you want Kevin Harris and all those guys you want all hands on deck when you get into the end of September uh, through November into the rest of your schedule. And there's been so many uh, storylines coming ahead of Columbia that one that is just kind of, you know, flew under the radar, I, I would say, just because of all the stuff we've already talked about. But uh, K-Ron Prunty leaving the program, how big of a loss was that for the Gamecocks? And um, any idea what happened there? Well, Michael, that was a huge loss for South Carolina. Karan Prunty was a the guy they beat Tennessee. You know, Ohio State was rumored to be involved. A lot of other programs. He was a freshman All-American at Kansas. And with South Carolina losing J.C. Horn, Israel McQuamu to the NFL draft, and then losing uh, Johnny Dixon, Shiloh Sanders, and Jamie Robinson to the transfer portal, they were really decimating the secondary. And they mm -hmm. felt uh, they could pair Karan Prunty with Cam Smith, who was an Army All-American, 
and played behind J.C. Horn and that they, you know, they could hold down that cornerback position. Well, Cam Smith uh, cracked a bone in his foot in the last week of workouts. He hasn't practiced yet. And then Prunty hits the transfer portal due to a, a personal matter, nothing related to football. And all of a sudden, South Carolina's uh, really scrambling in the secondary, which was already, you know, short on players uh, with a, you know, solid SEC experience. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, having said all that, you know, question marks on both sides of the ball. Uh, which unit do you think will be better this this season? Will be Marcus Satterfield's offense or Clayton White's defense? Well, I mean, honestly. I'm not trying to cop out, but I just think it's to be determined. I mean, I do think the strengths of this program and the best talent left behind by Will Muschamp and his staff was on both lines of scrimmage. Uh, South Carolina has experience at linebacker. They have some solid players there, but probably the most high-profile guys and the most talented guys on the roster are on the defensive front. So I would probably lean a little bit towards defense uh, because you got two five-star guys and a bunch of four-star guys on that defensive front. Now, let's um, – no disrespect to Vanderbilt. Let's put them to the side. But if there's another game that you're most confident that South Carolina is going to win in conference this year, Again, moving aside from Vanderbilt, which team is that? And it, and you better not say Tennessee. I mean, I have to say Tennessee. Okay. <laughs> uh, Tennessee or Auburn. I mean, maybe uh, maybe their coach will be out of COVID protocol by then. <laughs> maybe not. Um, look, no offense to your alma mater, but, I mean, they're down 39 players that hit the transfer portal. They've got a new coaching staff as well. And, you know, South Carolina and Tennessee, that's been a very close, hotly contested game for the last decade, right? Like most of those spreads have even been less than a touchdown. Mm -hmm. so, um, you know, Kentucky at home is a game that South Carolina really needs to get at Tennessee, and then probably Auburn. Those would be the next three after Vanderbilt. Uh, traveling to Missouri, Eli Drinkwitz, they're, they're building momentum out there. You know, that one, you know, would probably be fourth. Yeah, and that Kentucky series, for whatever reason, it's, uh, you know, it's gone Kentucky's way more often than not. And I think that's a game that all South Carolina fans think they should win every year. Maybe this is the year under new leadership. You flip that script and, you know, you can call it an upset if you want. But if South Carolina wins that, maybe they flip the momentum towards to their, their program. You know what I mean? Well, I can tell you it would be huge for Shane Beamer to start his uh, tenure with a win over Kentucky. I think it took Will Muschamp until 20. 19 to beat Kentucky. So he was 0 and 3, and then he beat Kentucky, had an off week, and then beat Georgia and Athens, <laughs> you know, led Florida after three quarters, and then the wheels fell off of the season. <laughs> uh, is, there a, is there a must win game, do you think, on South Carolina's schedule, or is that maybe unfair given all the transition? Well, I think they're. You know, four must-win games on the schedule, and that is Eastern Illinois, East Carolina, Troy, and Vanderbilt. Those games are must-win games. Three of the four are at williams Bryce Stadium. The only one that's not is a week two road trip to Greenville, North Carolina, and I'm still not sure why South Carolina is going on the road uh, to Greenville, North Carolina, but they are. And so to me, those are the four must-win games, and then you have the swing games. And if you get those four games, then you only have to get two games out of eight 
to get to six and six and get to a bowl game. And, you know, the way South Carolina's schedule lays out is it, you know, fair or unfair, you better be good early because you got Eastern Illinois at East Carolina, Georgia. So you should be two and one. Then you got Kentucky, Troy, Tennessee, Vanderbilt. You know, if South Carolina can have five or even be six and one at that point, I mean, there's really not a whole lot of wins on the back part of the schedule. Te at Texas A&M, Florida, at Missouri, Auburn, and Clemson, you know, probably Auburn at home is the best shot you got on the back side of the schedule. So South Carolina fans have to hope. Shane Beamer's uh, team can be really good in the first half of the season. Yeah, and speaking of that Auburn game, of course, there's so many connections with the coaching staff and everything there. Do you think that's going to create, uh, you know, a rowdy situation there for them coming into South Carolina? And, and will the fans show up or, you know, be so far removed from that that the, that the fan base will have moved on, do you think? Well, I mean – South Carolina's last win in football was against Auburn. <laughs> and it was their first win ever over Auburn. Will Muschamp got to two and two. And then just like the Georgia game, you know, you pull an upset over a top 20 team and the wheels fall off. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know there was some animus, uh, with, particularly with the fan base, with the way things went down with Mike Bobo, Will Friend, Tracy Rocker, of course, he, he didn't stay in Auburn long either. He went back to the NFL. Mm -hmm. I just think this is a program that's hungry for success. I think this is a fan base that had been divided. There was a certain portion of the fan base that was never going to support Will Muschamp, uh, no matter what he did, simply because he got fired at Florida. And I think – this South Carolina fan base right now is not only hungry for wins, but they are united for the first time since uh, the Thursday night to start the 2014 season when South Carolina was ranked number four in the nation and promptly got boat raced on the first game of the SEC network by Texas A&M. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, really the last time South Carolina's fan base has been galvanized in support of their football program. All right, last question for you, Keith. Uh, now that uh, training camp, you know, it's not officially done yet, but we're winding down here, kind of, you know, we should all have a better sense of uh, what the team's going to look like this this fall. Uh, are your expectations higher or lower than than where things ended, or, you know, when the camp started? And and how confident are you that uh, Shane Beamer can lead this team to a, a bowl trip this year? Well, I mean, I just don't think we know, right? Like, he's never been a head coach. He was an interim head coach uh, at Virginia Tech for a bowl game, I think, in the military bowl against Army, right? Like, hey, Brian McClendon was interim head coach for a bowl game at Georgia. A lot of good that did South Carolina. He was the wide receivers coach. So, um, you know, I will say this. I, I do think he's building a, a great foundation by establishing a team-first culture, a family-oriented atmosphere, and a lot of positive energy inside the program. Both his coordinators – uh, our first-time Power Five coordinators. I think each uh, has a uniquely qualified resume that you can make an argument for why they would be successful. Ultimately, it's going to be up to the players. I do think Shane Beamer uh, may be the right man at the right time, but he needs more help. Obviously, you know, if South Carolina had the talent to win nine or ten games, he would not be the head coach. Muschamp would still be the head coach. Uh, that is not the case. This is a rebuilding job. I would caution the fan base to be patient. But, you know, if you look back the first two years of the Will Muschamp era, he went from 
a team he took over that won three games and lost to the Citadel at williams Bryce Stadium to go into a bowl game. And then the next year, you know, he won nine games and beat Michigan uh, and Jim Harbaugh in Tampa on a cool, rainy day. I was there. And ultimately, though, he was not successful. So I think we'll just have to see if Shane Beamer is a long-term solution to, you know, the program at South Carolina. But I've been very impressed outside of him getting his quarterback hurt and, you know, not even getting him to the first scrimmage healthy, let alone the first game. I'm encouraged by, you know, everything he's done, the uh, coaching staff, the culture, the summer of Shane, as we called it on our podcast, with the momentum in recruiting and putting together a top 15, top 20 recruiting class. Everything's been positive for Shane Beamer. They did have some hiccups with Doty's injury, Prunty hitting the transfer portal. You know, we'll just have to see if they're able to overcome all of that. All right, Keith, I really appreciate you hopping on the line. Of course, everybody's got to give him a follow at KLSEP and check out his pod, the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, the go to podcast for all your South Carolina information. Keith, I really appreciate you. My pleasure, Michael. Uh, great speaking with you as always and look forward to having you back on our show hopefully sometime uh, soon. All right, so I just want to say thanks again to Keith for hopping on the line. I'm actually going to be on his show later in the week, so if you subscribe to that as well, you look forward to that. Me spieling on here on uh, Keith's show, so looking forward to that. And uh, looking forward to Cousin Shane being on the next episode of the show. He will be back, and I'm sure we'll have a lot more to talk about on the next episode. But uh, that's going to do it for this episode. And I do appreciate each and every one of you for hanging out and just hanging out all throughout the off season. And now we're now that we're here during the season, the numbers are going through the roof. YouTube's going through the you know the, the numbers are climbing. So I really appreciate all the feedback we've been getting. Uh, and even people have been telling us th things they don't like. And, it, hey, we appreciate that, appreciate that just as much because uh, that's how we know to, how to improve the show. So, uh, you know, give us some feedback, whether it's on Twitter or YouTube or, uh, you know, DM us on the social medias, whatever you want to do. Shoot us an email at thatsecpodcast at gmail.com. And, again, that's how you get us those five-star written reviews if you want your koozies. We're seeing a, an uptick in the reviews. The reviews are going through the roof. But uh, people, if you don't uh, reach out to us at that SEC podcast at gmail.com and let us know that you wrote that review, we can't send you a beer koozie free of charge. We got all 14 teams represented. So we really do appreciate each and every one of those. And I appreciate everybody for hanging out. We'll catch you on the next one.